Welcome everybody. Today's video is called Debunking Rabbi Shulman's Three Anti-Semitic Videos as Nonsense. I hope you're not offended, but I hope you have the decency to listen and uh, to check all the references, uh, amen, which prove uh, unequivocally that um, Rabbi um, Shulman's new videos about the anti-Semitic um, is absolute um, nonsense, praise be to God. Now, three of the things that I want to highlight to you when you're dealing with anti-Semitic attacks upon the Jewish faith, you cannot, number one, tackle it by falsely accusing the Bible, which we're going to show you what Rabbi Shulman um, falsely accuses the New Testament. You cannot do it. Number two, um, by hiding your own faults. So what the rabbi is, is doing is he's attacking the anti-Semitic attitude, but he's hiding his own faults. Now what's going to happen is that they're going to be exposed. So when someone exposes your faults that you're keeping hidden, you're going to look absolutely ridiculous. And the third thing is by ignoring Israel's sin. These are the three areas that if you are, if you attack the Christian Bible, but you do it incorrectly and foolishly, it's going to expose you, um, your point as being fraudulent. Number two, if you hide your faults, if they're exposed, you're going to look silly. And number three, by ignoring the real issues that should be dealt with, again, it makes your point um, and look foolishness. And so I'm going to expose um, those points. Firstly, the first point that um, um, Rabbi Shulman goes into, he, he criticizes the New Testament for not uh, dealing with women's sexual needs in marriage at all. That's what he said. He says the Talmud deals with it, um, but the Christian Bible does not. Now, for those of you who wonder why I'm continually debunking Rabbi Shulman, Isaiah, I want you to read this, 54, verse 17. And this is a command from the Lord God. He said this, anybody that rises up in judgment against you, that's our religion, against you, you shall, what does it say? Condemn. This is the heritage of, of the servants of God. It's our duty. So because Rabbi Shulman is rising up in judgment against the Christian faith, it is my duty to condemn him. This is the heritage of those who serve the Lord. So Rabbi Shulman criticizes the Christian Bible for not dealing with women's sexual needs inside of marriage, but he boasts the Talmud does. I don't know what Bible um, Rabbi Shulman's reading, but let's draw your attention to 1 Corinthians 7, verses 1 to 4. Get your Bible out, and I want you to read it. And here's what St. Paul says. He insists that every woman have her own husband, number one. Number two, that every man give the Jew benevolence, that means the sexual needs, to the woman. Why? Number three, because the man's body belongs to the wife. What does he say? Number four, the man has no power over the body, for it belongs to the woman's sexual needs. Aka, look at that. There is no religious document that deals with women's needs being met fairly more than that. And this is what I said to you. Uh, you cannot tackle anti-Semitism when you um, do not um, know the text of the Bible. You criticize it wrongly. You're therefore exposed to be foolishness. And that's to begin with. So by attacking the Christian faith and doing it wrongly, you need to apologize if you continually want to address anti-Semitism. But if you will not address for wrongly accusing our Christian Bible, therefore the rest that you're saying, amen, cannot be respected at all. Now, 
still on the same point. Remember I said to you, if you ignore your and hide your faults, that too will be exposed to make your videos look absolutely nonsense. Here's what one of the things Rabbi Shulman kept hidden. This book here, let me show it to you. It's the Code of Jewish Law. It's called the Shulkan Aruch. Now this book is in all the homes for hundreds of years of all Orthodox Jews. It's what they live by. It's the Code of Jewish Law. If you turn to Volume 4, Paragraph, sorry, page 15, Volume 4, page 15, Paragraph 8, here's what it says. And it says that thus, that any married woman goes to her husband and asks for sexual, a sexual time with her husband verbally, she, because of her brazen shamefulness, must be divorced, quote and unquote. Wow. Does that sound like a um, fair woman being treated fairly concerning the sexual needs? That if they come and even just ask verbally, politely, they're treated as being brazen and shamefulness and they must be divorced. Look it up yourself. And that is, is if of the highest teachings in Jewish Orthodox law. So both of these accounts, to begin with, reveal that um, Rabbi Shulman's attack upon the Christian Bible and his hiding um, really serious faults in the Orthodox um, Jewish code of law, amen, shows to begin with, amen, that his attacks uh, uh, upon the Christianity is coming from someone who's not educated properly in at all. He's not read the Christian Bible properly at all, as we see from 1 Corinthians 7, and he's keeping hidden very cruel attitudes towards women's sexual needs inside of Jewish law. So in a minute, we're just going to deal with the reasons why they would write such harsh things about women's sexual needs inside of Jewish law actually found inside of the Tanakh. So you didn't make a very good start, Rabbi Shulman. You get the Christian Bible wrong completely, and you're hiding some terrible things about how um, Jewish codes of law treat married women. Now, let's look at the, the, um, the, the Tanakh, the Old Testament, and see if we can see um, some um, things which look unfair. Okay, you have Deuteronomy chapter 22. Now, here we have a case that if a man is uh, marries a woman and he um, is found telling a lie on her, trying to frame her that she actually was not a virgin when she married, but he's actually just lying about it because the punishment um, um, put upon a woman if she lies about being a virgin um, when she's married is they get killed, they're executed. So if a man tries to get his wife killed by lying, and is found out, he gets a slap on the wrist, and all that happens to him is he's got to keep that wife for the rest of his life. Now, I don't know about you, um, if, if a man, I was a woman, just tried to have me executed and killed for doing nothing but just loving him and being loyal and giving him my virginity and wanted me dead, I don't know if I actually personally would want to be still married to that man and give that man children and be with that man for the rest of my life. I would rather be with somebody else who loved me and give that man um, children um, who love me. So it seems to be slightly unfair that the woman has got no choice in it. So the man tries to get her killed and yet all he gets is a slap on the wrist, but the woman would have been killed. Not fair. It is not fair. And not only that, the woman can't come and accuse the man for not being a virgin and have him killed. Very, very unfair. Now, I'm not saying there's good reasons for it, but it's very unbalanced and it's very, very unfair. Next scripture, Numbers chapter 5. If a man is jealous um, of his wife, he can have her dragged, uncovered in the temple and be made to 
um, water from the dust in the temple, etc., 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 humiliated. Um, I, I, but if the woman is jealous of the husband, she can't do anything. She just must be quiet. There's nothing for her. Again, unfair. So we're looking at the rights of women's needs. Totally, both these accounts, a woman can be killed amen, for, for, uh, for doing nothing. And yet, if she's found to be innocent, amen, she can't do anything. And if the man was not a virgin, the, um, the woman can't do anything at all. Very unfair. Now we have the daughter Zolophad in Numbers chapter 27. They come and they fight for their corner. Amen. Um, um, that they may um, have the inheritance because there's no sons. But there's no man fights for them. No man comes and does it. The daughters of Zola have had to do it for themselves. And watch this. The reason, point I'm making, there is no account inside of the Old Testament where men come to God to fight for women's rights. Women have to do it themselves. Men don't do it. No man comes to God and says, look, this account in Deuteronomy 22, when a man can have his wife um, executed to death, and, and but yet the, the woman has got no right to do that if she thinks the man's not a virgin. Or the fact that the woman it would have been killed um, um, and she's got no choice but therefore to stay married to him for the rest of her life when he just tried to have her killed. Nobody tried to come to God to fight for the woman's rights, either in the sort of water. Um, and no man came. But the woman here in Numbers 27 and the end of the book of Numbers, women come and fight for themselves. Why? Because men are not doing it. These are just some of the cases inside of the Old Testament that seem to be unfair and the rabbi won't address them. This is what I'm saying to you. When you hide your own faults, you make your video foolishness. What are the cases inside of the Bible? Dinah. When Dinah, um, 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 the, the, the man is killed, Dinah's not asked who she'd like to be with. Her opinion is not asked. There's nothing there. Just Simeon and Levi going to war. But yet Dinah's opinion is not asked at all. When we know the man of Shechem, it said he loved her. Okay? And you have, and even Jacob agreed with it. Okay? But Dinah's opinion is not asked. Does that look like women's needs fairly treated? We have Judges chapter 21. I want you to listen to this. Judges chapter 21. All of Israel agree that the daughters of Shiloh get abducted and raped against their will, against the brothers and father's will, and no one can do anything about it. And nobody says anything in Israel. Does that look like fair treatment of women? Any punishment? No. Let's look at 2 Samuel 13. David's firstborn son, Amnon, rapes his sister, Tamar. Does any priest bring a judgment? Does, any, does David bring a judgment? No. He totally gets away with it. No punishment whatsoever. Does that look like a good example of women's needs being treated fairly? No, it does not. Leah and Rachel are not allowed to go to Jacob's tent if they want to have their sexual needs met. Jacob refuses to go to bed with Leah, except Leah pays the man Drake. So, and then it goes on and on and on and on of these cases. And yet here comes Paul. Paul telling the men that they have no power over their bodies, for it belongs to the woman. You see, in all of these unfair um, scriptures the rabbi don't dare address, especially the ridiculous and harsh um, quotes about how a woman should be divorced in the code of Jewish law. And if you see, when you examine these things, you can see that women's needs and their treatment is absolutely not fair in the Tanakh at all. Now, don't get me wrong. There could be many reasons we could go into and we could debate, okay? But so too this applies with the New Testament, which we're going to deal with and look at some of the quotes that Paul makes, where it's nowhere near the seriousness 
of these things how women are treated in the Old Testament and especially in the Jewish code of law. No way at all. They are light um, compared to that. But we're going to look at them and see if we can understand them better in the context of the scripture of the New Testament, which the rabbi does not do. Now, the, the, the rabbi goes and attacks Paul's in the New Testament for saying that women should be silent in the church uh, and that a woman shouldn't, you know, rule over a man. Women must cover their heads, etc., uh, etc. Et and and um, but let's look at the context of um, the writings which by Paul wrote these writings. Firstly, you find inside of the Old Testament, the Jewish prophets did not want to go to the Gentiles. Why? Because they were really deeply um, in sin. And they were scared. You, you find the case with Jonah. Jonah is asked to go to Nineveh, that wicked city, and he just doesn't want to go. And God even have to warn Ezekiel that if he does not go to the wicked, then the blood shall be upon his shoulders. Why does God use that? Because they did not want to go, even there to the Gentiles. Even Rabbi um, Schneerson in Parsha Anthology goes in and in great detail showing you that how the Israel has failed to go out and to truly convert the gentle nations. Like convert what I mean is preach repentance to them, like Jonah. Amen. Which of course the book of Jonah, which is read every Yom Kippur, an example how the Jewish prophets did not want to go. They were reluctant. Why? Here we are, Paul now. Paul has gone to Ephesus. Now in Ephesus, they worship the goddess Diana. The whole of the city is in uproar and tries to kill Paul because he's preaching there um, where they worship and love women, the goddess Diana, which exalts women to a status uh, beyond which they should be. So Paul now has to break down that ideology that's so um, um, engraved in the minds of those in Ephesus that they want to kill Paul. Yeah, and then you find the same at Philippi. Paul's at Philippi and he's preaching and you've got witches or spiritualists coming round, speaking through evil spirits um, to Paul. And Paul has to wrestle with these evil spirits and cast them out again, which nearly gets him killed. Now, these ideologies would have come into the church. You find also in the temples, you find prostitution going along, so much so in the Greek culture that in the church in Corinth chapter 5, that they were rejoicing that a man was having sex with his mother. And Paul had to come and to really come down hard of them. So Paul has got some real hard things that they've developed through their um, idolatry that he's having to break them down. Bring women to understand the value of the command of God, be fruitful and multiply. Which is of course why Paul says that you become saved in childbearing. Why? Because you're obeying the word of God. Salvation is having faith in the word of God. And God says be fruitful and multiply. But what happened because of the ideology of, of having goddesses like Diana to worship, women are starting to forget the beauty of the role about being a housewife and bringing up children. So Paul now is having to remind them of that mitzah, of that command, amen, of bearing children. And in doing that, they become saved in valuing the word, the mitzahs of God. Praise be to God. And that's all Paul is saying. And that's why you find um, um, that what Paul does, he begins to break down these ideologies by making women to be silent to church. Instead of actually having women coming in and divining and speaking through evil spirits what they were doing, Paul had to break down these things by bringing silence into the church, by bringing women away from being goddesses like Diana, into being how God created them to be as a helpmate. God made woman to be a helpmate unto man. And so as 
Paul breaks that down, and women learn to be silent in the church, know the value of, of bearing children and bringing them up, the beauty of the commandment of being fruitful and multiplying. Once they begin to learn the value and begin to break away from goddesses and spiritualism, witchcraft and divining, then Paul builds them up. And here's the verses that the rabbi misses. Then Paul says, when you're now in the Lord, you see, once these things have been broken down, therefore in Christ there now is neither male nor female. What does that mean? You're completely equal. You become equal. Yet he goes on to say that therefore in the Lord, 1 Corinthians 7, the woman is of the man and the man is of the woman. It is now equal in sight of Christ. Therefore, then woman can speak. Because why? As Paul said, it is no longer you that speaks, but it now is Christ that speaks inside of you. But Paul had to break down the ideology of goddesses and spiritualism and prostitution and the things that were rampant inside of the church. And once he broke it down, and the woman become settled and become truly inside of God, then there is neither male nor female. They will be, become completely equal. And as you see with Paul, women come up to Paul and they prophesy to him. And Paul listens and accepts the prophecy because they're women now who are no longer under the idolatrous ideologies. They've been broken down. And now inside of Christ, there's neither male nor female. Uh, praise be to God that man is of the woman and woman is of the man. So you un need to understand the context and the issues that Paul is dealing with to truly understand, which is quite simple. But they're nowhere near on the level of, as Judges 21, the whole city being allowed to rape the daughters of Shiloh and nothing's done about it. David's son rapes his, his sister and there's nothing done about it. Praise be to God. And all the other unfairness of Deuteronomy 22 and the Jewish code of law of divorcing your woman for asking for sex. These things are extremely serious. Amen. Which are totally not looked, totally not dealt with. You've hidden the things in the, in the Talmud because they look shameful. They look shameful. And, and, and last of all, amen, dealing with the things of Paul, amen, are easily understood. If you read the text properly with an open mind but here comes the last part we're going to be dealing with when dealing with anti-semitism you truly need to look at what is the real problem why are the nations attacking you in an anti-semitic way amen and you need to deal with the reason to stop it not dealing with things wrongly which rabbi shulman has done so we're going to be dealing with a minute what are the real reasons that is causing it and how do we stop it? Praise be to God. Now this is what the Bible says, that God says, um, in Jeremiah 22 verse 8, Ezekiel 39 verse 23, 24, God warns Israel, look up the text, that you have prepared the nations for this. For what? The nations wondering, amen, why God has treated Israel so hard. And this God explains to the nations it is because of their sins, plural. So when bad things are happening to you, whether it be verbal or physical, you know, um, um, persecution, you name it, it has to be studied through understanding what is your sins. And these scriptures are said at the end of the time. At the end of the time, amen, the nations want to know, and God said it's because of Israel's sins. So you really need to be examining your sins to make the anti-Semitism stop. Not attack the anti-Semitics, amen, but, that, but yet don't warn Israel of the sin. And I never hear the rabbis warning Israel of the sins like the prophets did at all. They're too busy dealing with the anti-Semitics instead of actually the issue of the sin which is causing the problem, which is why God said, Ezekiel chapter 7, he will send the wickedness of nations after you because of your sin. Now, God warned Israel. Now, look at these texts. It's not me saying, so if you're offended, be offended with God. It said this, Micah 1 verse 16. 
Make yourself bald, pull your hair out, and your clothes off. Michael 116. Why? Because it shows God your attitude and repentance. So all your peots and all your beards, shave off. Let God see your boldness. Amen. And not your religious Jewish pride that he might see that you're repentant. What happens? Israel doesn't do it. Ezra 9, verse 3. Ezra comes along, pulls his hair out and pulls his beard out. Amen. To show Israel what they should be doing to repent. Are they doing it today? No. When did they do it the last 2,000 years? No. Let's look at Nehemiah 15. Sorry, Nehemiah 13, verse 25. Nehemiah sees that nobody's pulling the hair out, making themselves bald to show God repentance. Amen. That's all the way that the rabbis like to look. No one's doing it. So what does Nehemiah come? He comes and he pulls the priest's hair out, their payouts off, their beards off. Amen. Slaps them and curses them. Uh, amen. To show them that this is what they should be doing. Do they do it? No, they're not doing it. Why? Because they're not doing the, dealing with the issues of sin. So instead they're attacking the anti-Semitics instead of repenting. What is Ezekiel 7 verse 18? Go and read it. Because you've not done this, I will make, God says, all the heads of Israel bold. Wow. What did Hitler come and do in Auschwitz? Okay. He shaved the heads off of every Jew. That all the heads were bald. And if you had repented, God, Ezekiel 7, wouldn't have sent the wickedness of nations because you repent. And what are you doing, Rabbi Schumann? You're occupying yourself with nonsense videos attacking anti-Semitics instead of dealing with the sin issue which Israel needs to repent of before judgment comes again. So how is the judgment coming? God warns us in Daniel 11 verse 36, amen, that, that God is going to send the judgment, 11, Daniel 11 verse 40, Daniel 8 verse 13, Daniel 8 verse sorry, 17 verse 23, all of this is going to happen at the end, Hosea chapter 3, Hosea chapter 5, not until the end, amen, you're going to turn, Deuteronomy 32, not until the end will you turn, amen, when God, amen, Daniel 8, 25, sends the beast, uh, the third Haman, as Rabbi Schmeersman calls him, who's going to destroy the holy people, Daniel chapter 7, Amen. What's the chapter? Sorry, Daniel chapter 5, verse 12. Two thirds of Israel will die. Zechariah chapter 13, verse 8 to 14. Two thirds of Israel will die in Israel at the end. Why? Because you're so busy attacking the anti Semitics, you're missing the point that should be dealt with is your sin. Now, why? Here's some of the scriptures, okay? Ezekiel 5, verse 5. You're worse than all the nations. Ezekiel 6, verse 69. For I did not speak in vain that I was going to bring this evil to you. Amen. Why? That you should be disgusted with yourself. Please listen to this. Ezekiel 6, verse 69. That you, Israel, should be disgusted with yourself. You're making, you're, you're, you're disgusted with the anti-Semitics instead of yourself. That's why you can't stop anti-Semitism. Amen. Ezekiel 16, after you there'll never be a nation as bad. Ezekiel 16, verse 53 to 63, Sodom will become your daughters, that you may become ashamed, that all the things I do for you are good. It's not because of you. It is only because of my namesake, Ezekiel 36, verse 31 and 32. You see, and you need to meditate on these scriptures to see the serious thing that must be dealt with is the sin whereby Israel has backslidden and rejected God and the Mashiach. Isaiah 53, for he we despised and we rejected him. So please don't occupy yourself doing videos. 
especially when you're not getting the Christian text right, especially when you're hiding your own faults, especially when you're not dealing with the text fairly compared to the text in the New Testament, and especially when you're not dealing with the sin that Israel has done, which is going to bring them into a final and severe judgment in these last days. I'll leave you with the scripture, 2 Samuel 15, verse 5 to 13. David is being judged by God and he's running from the enemies in Israel uh, where he's up to run away from his kingdom. And as he's running away, he's being cursed by Shammai. 2 Samuel 15, verse 5 to 13, and he's having dirt thrown at him. He's having stones cast at him and his soldiers want to kill this man. And David said no, because God has told him to curse David. God is sending him to throw dirt and stones at me. So don't. Maybe God will see my tears and turn it into a blessing. And that, Rabbi Shulman, is the attitude of an Israeli that has been humbled by God, especially when he knows the extent of his sin. But those people that do not know how they've sinned and how they've offended God, especially Israel. Remember you, remember God said, no nation after you is as bad as you especially after all that God has done for you. But here you are now, rising up, amen, and throwing stones and dirt back at the anti-Semitics instead of thanking God because it's God that has sent them to speak about you in this way and be humble, amen, and repentant, amen, and weep and cry for your sins and for the sin of Israel that God, God, are you listening, my turn it to the blessing, not you dealing with it unfairly, incorrectly, totally in a biased manner by not dealing with your text properly and hiding shocking things said about women in the code of Jewish law. That's all I've got to say is the word that God said to Zephaniah, I will leave in Israel a humble, repentant people and except you become like that, you will not be included in the remnant at the end of time. Please listen to this message carefully. Examine the text fairly before raising up. Amen. And as I said to you before, the commandment of God is this, Isaiah 54 verse 17. All who rise up in judgment against you, against us, we must condemn. For this is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. And I don't know why Christians are not doing it more. But Rabbi Shulman, I will be at your heels if after every video you release and showing people the other side, which you really unfairly are not doing properly. Unequal, which measures, Rabbi.